Well, it's a great blessing to be able to bring God's word to you a second time in a row. It's a, a wonderful thing. Um, we are picking up where we left off in 1 Samuel chapter 17, considering this event in the life of David, in the life of Israel. And I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's a long chapter, and I don't mean to get you to brace yourself. It's a fun chapter. It's, it's, this, is, this is 1 Samuel. This is not some parts of the Bible that, that don't have as much character to them. So, But I just want you to get wrapped up in the events that 1 Samuel 17 is going to lay out for us. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, over nine feet tall. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper, and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle cry, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. 
And the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail, and David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me. I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shaarim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, Inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would open this word up to us. We ask that you would give us ears to hear. Lord, we are hungry. We need nourishment. We pray that you would feed us, that you would digest this for us, that you would treat us as your children and make this understandable to us, that that we may take it in, that we may consume it and be consumed by it and live it out in our lives this week. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Each of us 
has a certain way that we like to get things done. Some of us are smaller, younger, so we're still figuring out what those ways are, but you figure it out pretty quick when your mom or your dad says, not that way. You find out they have a way they like things getting done, and it's different than yours. But this fact about human beings that we have our own way of doing things is, is it's part of who we are. It's, it's cliche. It's my, it's, it's my way or the highway. We celebrate it. I did it my way. Don't, don't, no recording albums coming anytime soon. In fact, that was such a popular sentiment that it's been rehashed multiple times by multiple different genres of musicians. It's even assumed, well, you know, she does it her way and I do it my way. We all have a way that we like things to be done. And to be clear, that's not in and of itself a bad thing, that we have ways that we like to get things done. It's actually part of how we reflect the image of God. Because God has a way that he gets things done. But... Oftentimes, our way of getting things done and God's way of getting things done don't actually align. And we find that out when God's way intersects with ours. <laughs> and suddenly, we're the child coming to our parent, and we're saying, this, this doesn't match up. Your way is not my way. Well, our passage today, as we continue it from last week, we're going to be looking at what happens, what ought to we what ought we to ex I'll try that again. What should we expect when God's way intersects with ours? What should we look for? What should we think would happen when God's way intersects with our way? So first we need to understand God's way as this particular narrative presents it. It's not the entire way that God works, but it's one way that God works, and it's a prominent one. I think in order for us to rightly understand God's way here, we need to acknowledge a little bit of bias here. So for many of us, the story of David and Goliath is, well, we've heard it since we were little. But even if you've never heard the story of this David and this Goliath, if you watch movies or read books, the story of David and Goliath has been retold multiple times. In fact, this has gotten ripped off by secular culture a lot. It's the story of the underdog. So, so when you're watching a movie and you see someone who is so puny and so weak and, and, and he's got nothing to recommend himself, you're just waiting, right? You're just waiting. And here's the big evil. And in fact, the Marvel movies have had a really hard time with this because they make their heroes look so great and then all of a sudden they have to be really puny against something even greater, and it's very confusing. Again, modern movies, you know, you just, just bridge over that, bridge over that. We love the story of the underdog. It's, in bre it's bred into us, but is that reality? If we were here at this time, if we were Saul, if we were the king over the armies of Israel, and we were looking at David, would we have seen, oh man, this is going to be great. This guy, he's got what it takes because he's got nothing. What kind of general does that, <laughs> right? Who's not desperate? Who's not desperate? You know, put me in, coach. You stink at basketball. I'm not putting you in. What, what, what kind of leader thinks the underdog is the way to go. And this is a moment of crisis. And God's champion has stepped forward. Imagine him. He's young. He's a boy. No, don't inflate your idea of who David was. Don't diminish, as many people have, who Goliath was. Look at David. Look at him. He's like one of our high school graduates. And he's done a great job at his summer job. But it's just been a summer job, tending the sheep. No offense, high school graduates, love you. 
but he's just a boy. He's not even a raw recruit. He doesn't even go to war. And look at him. He's dressed like a shepherd. He's got a simple tunic and a sling and a stick. Look at him. He's got lots of heart. That's all you need, right? Positive thinking. But he's kind of a pretty boy. At least that's what Goliath thinks. He pegs him well. He's like, I think you should be playing a harp to make your king happy. He's handsome and ruddy. Think you're more for dancing than for fighting. He's a pretty boy. Imagine we've got one of our high school students and we say, we've been invaded. They're on our turf as the Philistines were in Judah. And we say, all right, who do we need? Who do we need? They've got this special forces crew. Let's get a bunch of high schoolers together who have no experience in warfare. Yeah? And let's send them in. Yeah, it's going to be great. Isn't it amazing how when we read this story, that's how we look at David? We skip to the end. And we miss God's way. David is young. He's weak. He's puny. He's inexperienced. He's nothing. He doesn't stand a chance. He's going to get eaten alive. Any good general would know that. So what happens when God's way interacts with Saul's way? You see, in verse 37, we hear... And David comes to Saul and he gives his explanation like we talked about last week. The Lord has delivered me before and he will deliver this Philistine to me. And David says, go and the Lord be with you. Excuse me, Saul says, go and the Lord be with you. Saul recognizes, I, I think, well, the, the Lord may be in this. Go. And do you notice the next verse? Saul clothed David with armor and a helmet of bronze. Saul does not have the Holy Spirit anymore. We learned last time that the Lord had removed it from him. He's a spiritless king. What does a spiritless king do when he sees God's way? What is Saul's way? Hmm, I'll add to it. Look at this weak, puny, pathetic person. This is God's way? Okay, I think I can see where God might be working, but God needs a little help. I'll add to it. Let's get him some armor. He acknowledges it's the Lord's way, but he adds armor because that's what you need to go against a giant. I mean, armor is fine. All those soldiers out there had armor. We, we're not speaking against armor here, as in, all right, everybody go out and get slings. That's, that, that's not what we're talking about. This isn't a comparison between the weapons of men. This is that when Saul sees... David, without the spirit to open his eyes, he thinks you need to add the weapons of men to God's way to make it effective. And brothers and sisters, we are all soul. God works in us and he exposes our weakness. He shows us our sin. He, he, he exposes that we really don't have a lot to go on, even though we have a lot of the weapons of men. We have money. We have some measure of power. We have facilities. We can do a lot. We have health. We have strength. And then suddenly we don't. And he shows us that we hang by a thread, that we are actually finite, weak, broken people. And what do we do? We say, well, this is never going to work. Look at Goliath. And what do we do? We add to it. We hate that we are weak. If you've ever felt weak, what is a gut reaction that you have? I need to get strong. I need to do more to get strong. How do I do more? Let's go find some tools, some tips, some tricks. My marriage is a mess. Let's go get tips and tricks. Let's, I, I'm struggling with a besetting sin. Oh, uh, tips and tricks. What can I do? And the Lord is saying, my way is exposed, is made known in your weakness. Don't add 
to what I'm doing. I'm showing you, you can't do it. But as he works on us, and this gigantic evil looms against us, instead of fanning into flame the work that he's doing and saying, Lord, I don't believe. Help my unbelief. Give me more of you. Give me more of your spirit. Instead of fanning that into flame, we load ourselves down and one another with our best methods for fixing the problem. There's nothing wrong with armor, but it is not something we add to God's work in us. There are tools that he's given to us, but they're not to be used to replace the work that he's doing in us, to make us feel strong in ourselves. Because what does that end up doing? Now we're weighed down. And it's almost comical when you see, imagine David in your mind, weighed down with this armor. <laughs> okay. It's almost comical. That's why I love reading these stories, because if you get into them, they're, they are in living color. Well, what happens as we move on? What does it look like when God's way meets Goliath's way? What does it look like when God's way meets Goliath's way? Goliath here represents evil, the evil one. What does it look like when David meets Goliath? Goliath disdains and curses it. This is God's way. Did you notice Goliath is insulted? This is what you've got? It's not that, that, David, it's not that Goliath is thinking, I am gonna, I'm going to trounce you. This isn't going to be any fun. It's insulting to him. This is the kind of person you think is worth coming against me? It'd be like sending the janitor to greet a foreign dignitary. They'd be insulted. This is what you think of me? And Goliath says, I'm Goliath. I've been training my whole life for this. And this is what you've got to send against me. And in his pride and his arrogance, he epitomizes evil. Brothers and sisters, this is what we see in our society. They look at the church. They look at us. And we're saying, we're going to preach the word. We're going to pray, we're going to administer the sacraments, and we're going to overthrow evil. The gates of hell don't stand a chance, and they're insulted. Where are your political action committees? And they, and they come to us, and they appeal to us with the tools of men, with the work of men, and they say, come out here where you can really be effective. It's insulting. It's insulting that you would come at us with word and prayer and sacrament. What are you doing in there every week? You think that's making a difference? So we ought not be surprised when our humble work here, seeking to walk in God's ways, would meet with ridicule. Polite ridicule sometimes, and sometimes really harsh ridicule, because it's insulting to them. They think they're more important. And honestly, when, the, when, when our flesh gets a hold of us, we think we're more important. I need something better and, and, and more impressive than, than these humble means that God has given me to walk in. I, I, I need something to make me strong. What do you expect to do with a sling and a stick, David? Was Goliath talking? He might as well say, what good is prayer, preaching, discipleship, humble service, loving one another? What good is that? What do you expect to do with a stick? I curse you by my gods because clearly your God doesn't know how to fight. I'm going to serve you for breakfast. I will consume you. This is what evil says to us. Says to us in the news, says to us in the public fair, says to us when we 
are consumed with it, says to us in our dreams, says to us in our falling asleep at night, I don't stand a chance, says to us when we're looking at our computer screen and we've done it again, it says, I will serve you for breakfast. I will consume you. You don't stand a chance. That's what he says to us. Because we are weak. <laughs> and we are pathetic. And we did sin again. And we did fall again. And we are such little boys. Or girls. He says, I will eat you for breakfast. That's what happens when God's way meets Goliath's way. Well, what does it look like when God's way meets David's way? David is representative here of the one who is filled with the Spirit, the anointed one. What does David's way look like? David, he proclaims it. David proclaims the way of God. Do you notice David's attitude? He is saying, this isn't about me. Everybody keeps looking at me. Everybody keeps looking at what I'm going to do about this giant. This isn't about me. This is about the Lord of hosts. I come to you, not in my own strength, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. I don't come with the kind of weapons you use. But here's what I want us to see. First, he's not embarrassed by that. He's not embarrassed by his weakness. He's not ashamed of it. He embraces it. And he proclaims God's name. I'm going to defeat you. I'm going to defeat you. Me, little David, full of weakness, inexperienced. So why? So that everyone will know there is a God in Israel. Why do we in our weakness overcome sin? Because we learned how to be strong? No, to proclaim the glory of God's name, that he saves those who are weak, those who are helpless. And we do it without sword or spear. In our weakness, in the face of great evil, what is our hope? If you've not embraced God's way, it might surprise you. Our great hope, our great hope, when our way meets God's way in the face of evil, our great hope is that it's not actually about us. The evil one doesn't care most about us. He is defying God when he comes after God's people. Our great hope is that it's not about us first and foremost. It's about him and the glory of his name. The battle is his, David says, because it's all about him. He's the one who has set this whole thing up like he set up Moses and Pharaoh and like he set up so many battles to bring glory to his name. That is why his way, God's way, is the way that has victory, that is secure, even though it comes through such weak and pathetic examples of virtue and holiness like us, sinners. Israel's deliverance by the hands of David was secure because God's way uses the weak and despised things of this world to accomplish salvation for his people so that all the glory goes to God alone. And we say, all glory be to your name. We embrace it, our weakness, because it's not about us. It's about him. It's about his majesty, his beauty, the, the worship of his name. We come here every week as sinners saying, you saved us. It's all about you. And we glorify his name. I want you to notice, at this point in time, the battle is kind of a footnote to this lengthy story. How long does it take for him to tell us the really good part? You know, this is the part that if it was a movie, coming back to movies, this would be the part that would be really long. 
today. You know, who cares about plot? We need action. Okay, I did it again. I'm, I'm not going to, when I preach again, I won't diss modern movies again. But this is the part we all have been waiting for. Take him down, David. Take him down. And yes, we should. But that's not the focus of this writer. The focus is on David's theology that he just proclaimed. The focus is not on the battle. It's only a couple of verses. And so our focus ought to be on the Lord, ought to be on His name, ought to be on God's way, because that is the way it is still today. God's way is the same today. We follow the Son of David, Jesus, who overcame, who slew the evil one, Death, sin, without a sword. In fact, the only sword that was used in his defense, he said, put it away. That's the one we follow. And why is there so much emphasis here on the head? You can reread that. The head of Goliath, it's a little grotesque from a modern sensibility. Keeps talking about his head. He represents evil. The head of the serpent will be crushed. And that's what Jesus did who became a curse, who became weak, who became shameful for our sakes on the cross. Why? For the joy that was set before him, the glory that he prayed the Father would give to him, that he may glorify the Father for the glory of God that he is now enjoying and that he invites us to. And so we, like the rest of the Israelites, run after him conquering. Goliath is down. And we pick up our weapons and chase after the rest of the Philistines, but not with the weapons of men. We conquer as living sacrifices. That's what Paul calls us. We are living sacrifices, humbly serving, loving, praying, ministering to one another, bearing one another's burdens, feeling our weakness and finding grace for it. This is what our life looks like. It's not, it doesn't sell well unless you have the Spirit. And that is the, that is the key for us. Let's ask for His Spirit now. Our Father, we pray that You would fill us with Your Spirit, that Your way would be our way that you would make us more and more aware of our need for you and then give us more of yourself. And we pray this in Christ's name.